Hi, and welcome to City Desk, a behind the scenes look at Santa Barbara's top local news stories. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts, and I'm joined by an all star lineup of local journalists for an inside look at these headlines. A stunning move at City Hall jump starts a new era of electoral politics. What's behind a bizarre lawsuit against Lois Capps? And an exclusive interview with the author of Orange is the New Black, the new book for UCSB and Santa Barbara Reads. Joining me is prize winning local columnist Starshine Rochelle, Josh Molina, politics and policy reporter for Newshawk, and Nick Welsh, executive editor of the Santa Barbara Independent. Thank you all for coming, and thanks for being here for the world premiere edition of City Desk. Nick, you're up first. Um, most of our viewers already know that the city council backed down to a legal threat and agreed to change Santa Barbara's system of uh, elections from an at-large to a, a district system. Why is that? Uh, Barry Cappello, uh, ABC. A, Barry Cappello, uh, they were looking at a three to four million dollar- uh, World's most kind-hearted, uh, most kind-hearted lawyer. Yes, I, that's what ABC stands yeah. for. <laughs> and he threatened to sue, if, if he wasn't involved, um, this, this wouldn't have gone uh, the way it did. But he, he packed the mean punch and uh, the city decided discretion was a better part of valor. They got off with a $600,000 uh, price tag as opposed to three and a half. And who are, who are the plaintiffs? Who were his clients? Uh, the plaintiffs are, um, it, it's actually like the three old men. Um, you have Benji uh, uh, Chavarez, you have uh, Frank Vinales, uh, Leo Martinez is not one of the plaintiffs, but he is really the one who made this happen. Veteran he, Latino activist. Those three go back to Casa de la Raza formation back in the 70s, and that's where they know each other from. Then you have Jackie Inda, um, who is very much involved in the, the effort to stop the gang injunction that we just had, and is sort of coming on as a, a community activist. And then you have Cruzito Cruz, the perennial uh, Aztec warrior, jailhouse lawyer, poet extraordinaire, uh, gadfly candidate, who is the odd man out, and he has not signed off on the deal. But the, but the big winner is obviously politically the whole Latino community. What, what, what happened, the deal is there are two seats. Two seats have to be majority minority. So Out of the seven. Out, out of the well, six seats and then the mayor. So, the, the committee said, we don't care about how you draw the lines. What we want is two seats. So we'll see how that goes. Um, Kathy Murillo occupies the west side, which is probably going to be one. She's an incumbent. She'll be hard to beat. Uh, the east side is the one seat that is still open that would be um, uh, a Latino seat. And I was checking today, there hasn't been a candidate, a, a council member from the east side uh, since the 70s. Um, so it is certainly the most underrepresented area of the city. What, um, so what happens next? What, where does this go from here? Uh, what happens next is, um, this is starting up in November, so there's three seats up uh, that will go from at-large to district, and that will happen um, this November. So people in, on the west side, the east side, and the Mesa have very little time to kind of figure out who's going to run. So there's going to be this mad scramble. Um, Sounds uh, great. Yeah. I mean, it's good for political writers anyway. No? So uh, who are the incumbents who are up? Uh, Kathy Maria is up uh, and uh, Randy Rouse is up. And Randy lives on the Mesa, uh, you know, owner of the Paradise Cafe, downtown organization for years, really nice guy, Mr. Mello. Um, I think he's going to be hard to beat on the Mesa. Kathy, I think she's going to be pretty solid, hard to beat on, on the, the west side. Um, it's going to be hard to find people in the neighborhoods to bring out the run. But it's going to be a lot cheaper. It's going to be a lot cheaper. Yeah. What, what neighborhood do you live in? Just Hidden Valley. So who's, who's Star Science? We don't know that yet. We know that there's, they, they haven't, pre oh, before we get to November, they have to draw the district. And that process will be happening between now and April. So that's really what's mm -hmm. happening. And is this being done by a non-biased, independent uh, uh, commission that uh, will have no politics in it? No, it's the city council. <laughs> and so the city council's first uh, meeting, uh, the city's first meeting on is going to be this Saturday. And they'll have had four by um, April. You covered City Hall for a long time. What is it, what, how's this going to change things, you think? 
I don't know. It's interesting. There's there's two seats up, and there's three seats there's, up. There's, there's Dale is is termed out. Francisco, so Francisco is, is termed, termed out. out. So uh, potentially, it's an opportunity for a big change. I don't. I, mean, I think it's great. I think it's great that there's going to be a uh, you know, change in how we elect candidates, and hopefully, it'll bring more diversity. Uh, I don't. I don't know how it's going to work on the ground because at the end of the day, you're you're still going to have. Uh, candidates who are, are going to run, are going to raise money, who are going to do all the things that they need to do to win. And you know, even if you have it broken down into a district, if you have a candidate who, who's just going to run to run, who's not going to raise any money, who's not going to knock on doors and make a serious effort, I don't, I don't know if district elections are going matter, to matter too much. You know, you look at Kathy Murillo, who uh, when she announced she was going to run. It was a surprise. You know, journalists going to run. And uh, kind of unsure how successful she was going to be, but she's kind of the example of, of a Latina candidate running, working hard, knocking on doors. I mean, she knocked on everybody's door. She was engaged. She worked really hard. She raised money. She lined up her endorsements, her political support, and she won. Um, I think you're still going to need to do that if you're going to be successful. And I don't, I don't know. We'll see. You know, I hope there's more diversity. Let me, let me ask you this, though. This is happening, the district elections, which is on behalf of the Latino community. I mean, that's who the lawsuit right. was, was filed. It's happening at the same time we have these kind of street demonstrations going on around town, over on Milpas Street about the business district, uh, in front in uh, De La Guerra Plaza about a, a newspaper's use of a particular word. Uh, does this all fit together? Is this all part of a broader... I, I think there's... It's, it's, it, it does sort of accidentally, there's not an a, a intentional weave to it. I think that the sort of electricity and the charge behind ethnic politics is you know, getting hotter in Santa Barbara for a long time. It's been very quiet, um, but I think that you have a group of activists with Poder, uh, and their Poder kind of stands put, for what is Poder? I don't know what it stands for, but they they <laughs> nobody nobody knows. Let's get a new but acronym. They came out of the, the gang injunction, and they were about you know uh, ethnic profiling, and, and uh, they weren't going to take any crap. And they were they're kind of a flash mob organization. And so they, what they can do is they can show up, they can bring people out in front of the news press, they can they can deliver a crowd. Um, it kind of backfired when they went against uh, Mr. El Bahio, um, the restaurant owner. The restaurant owner, and this is getting way in the weeds. I don't know if you want to get that. The EBIT, the Eastside Business Improvement District. That is a big, hot, sexy line in the sand. EBIT the is better than Poder. It's EBIT, just yeah, Poder takes on EBIT. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, don't you but, love political journalism? Okay, but the Great. thing here is this: is that this fight over a business improvement district, which is really nasty, which is really personal which has a very strong sort of whitey versus Latino mm -hmm. undertone, overtone, takes place on the east side, which is where the one district is up for grabs is, and it will probably have a lot to do with the outcome of this first district election race. Interesting. So something we'll be watching, I imagine, for the next 30 or 40 years. Yes. Um, Josh, Republican Chris Mitchum, <clears throat> who lost to Congresswoman Lois Capps la uh, last November, has now filed a legal action against her, charging his feelings were hurt, I think, in, the, in terms of the campaign. Or is this the dumbest lawsuit in history or, or not? What do you think? <clears throat> well, I, mean, I don't know. It's, it's funny that he, he would file this lawsuit. It is politics. He has to know that this is going to happen. This is going to be expected. What is he alleging, exactly? Uh, he's alleging that... Uh, this ad, so this ad, she ran this ad that said, it was spliced to say that he's not going to Washington to represent people of the 24th Congressional District. And uh, what, he had what, what he had actually said was, I'm not going to Washington to bring back ball fields. Uh, I'm going there. For the people of the 24th. Right, which uh, I wish he would have gone, gone there to bring back ball yeah, fields. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would have been a popular, <laughs> popular move on his part. Uh, so, so he, there was this ad that she ran, and it spliced it. And it, you know, he clearly looks like she, he's saying, "I'm not going to Washington to represent the people of the 24th district." So, uh, clearly, it was a misleading ad. And everyone that I talked to, uh, you know, even Cap supporters, felt like 
yeah, that was a little bit over the line. And uh, that's politics, though. You know, at least he wasn't photoshopped with a wine glass in his hand like Susan. Has Susan that ever Jordan. happened? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, Susan Jordan in the assembly race, you know, she was photoshopped with a, a wine glass in her hand. And she the never champagne had champagne flute. Champagne. By whom? Yeah, yeah it was, she was running against the Doss Williams, and it was the Doss Williams uh, campaign, somebody on that campaign. The juggernaut. Yeah. yeah, you know, so, you know, this kind of stuff happens. And I, I don't know that he's going to win a lawsuit for saying that, that this was uh, the reason that he lost the race or the reason that... Uh, there was some, uh, you know, it, it hurt his feelings. There was emotional distress. Emotional, in, in, intentional infliction of emotional distress is one of the. Really? One yeah. of the, yes. Let me ask you something. If if this is something, if we can say like, oh, this happens, it's politics, we know that's going to happen. Is this the next thing that's going to happen? If it, people are going to, well, yeah, we know that happens, but now people are going to, the next thing that happens is we, we sue each other over it. <laughs> More work for lawyers. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. There, there was a big backlash with that. You know, I, I think that, that campaign knows that that was over the line mm -hmm. and even you know Santa Barbara you know this region Dirty pool. that's kind of frowned upon yeah, so she totally slimed him yeah. and uh, if you are the high school nurse which is you know we all know the nicest Los person in and, Congress and, and she always gets a Washingtonian magazine poll of you know congressional aides nicest member of Congress award. So if you're the nicest member of Congress, you don't want to be sliming your opponent with that kind of ad. But does she care? How long is Lois going to be around, Josh? Oh, well, that's... Can you give us a date? <laughs> <laughs> that's the million dollar question. Everybody asks that. Uh, uh, clearly, we're, we're coming up at the end here. Right? 76 it's, years old now, I think. She's seven, yeah. Even older than me, if you can imagine that. <laughs> Clearly, it's coming to the end, which brings up a good point is what's going to happen when she finally decides not to run and who's going to run for that seat. There's a lot of talk about Mayor Helene Schneider uh, running for that seat. Of course, Salud Carbajal is uh, long believed to be eyeing that seat. So there's going to be some really good uh, political stuff going on down the road, uh, potentially with, with those two. Those two are going to face off for that seat. and. You know, they have a huge wedge issue right now with Highway 101. and uh, now they, They're on the other opposite sides of that and been very bitter. Yeah, Helene has really um, uh, put herself out there on, on that issue, and uh, she's got something to run a race on now and uh, on a regional basis, and that kind of positions her to... To be a challenge to, to, to salute if if it goes that way. What about what about Laura Caps? What about Lois's daughter? Yeah, I mean that's that I don't I don't know it well enough to know if she's going to run. That's always something that we hear, you know, that that's also a possibility. But uh, I don't know. Right now, it sort of feels like this is a race between Carbajal and and Schneider. Do you think it matters if Santa Barbara is represented by a woman in Congress or not? It matters how to you as a voter. No, it doesn't matter to me personally. So if it was Helene and Salud and not saying who you would pick, it, it be, you would just kind of, the, the fact that she's a woman would not would not no. get your vote on Come that. on, we had Andrea C. Would it, would it make you vote for her? <laughs> it might. Because Actually, she's a woman? Yeah. Why? Because I, I, I think um, I think women do, do better in politics. I think that they, they have more. They do better work or they're more successful? They do better work. They're, they're, they're more collaborative. Prior, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know that you can say that about Helene Schneider right now. I think part of the problem here isn't just that her position, hmm. it's that she sort of has been acting in isolation. And the, the, the people who support the freeway widening be like, she's not working with us, she's not talking with us, we can't, we can't uh, work uh, with her. Um, certainly, when you talk to people who have known her for a long time, what you hear more and more is like, I'm not talking with her as much. So I think that. Helene does have a, a, a powerful issue. I think there is an undercurrent of hostility towards the freeway widening. Once construction actually starts, there's going to be a whole lot more. But I, I think that she may have painted herself into a corner here. Salud has been, I mean... Well, she's all, isn't she also going after his money, his, his, his financial base in Montecito with the, 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 yeah, the Del Squardo and all that stuff? She's painted herself in a corner, but she's served... Two terms as mayor. I mean, not quite. What, what's her next move? So, 
she has to be thinking about what she's going to do now. And so she paints herself in a corner, but she's taking a risk. She has to do something. She, she can't just, she can't fade away. And she could run for supervisor, but then she's going to run against Doss Williams, who moved to Carpinteria to run for that he's gonna seat. He's going to run for, he's going to run for well, I mean, salute seat. Yeah. I mean, that's where the rumor is. You know, he, he lives in Carpinteria now. So she's got a choice. Am I going to run against possibly Salute Carbajal? Am I going to run against possibly Doss Williams? Uh, you know, as you know, you can't just run because you're a good candidate. You have to have give people a reason to vote for you. You know, on the other hand, you know, on this whole collaboration men-women thing, Salute, both his strength and his weakness, it seems to me, is hyper-collaboration. I mean, Salud's answer to everything is, let's get everyone around a table and, and have the stakeholders talk. talk through the issues. And, but, you know, it, 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 it seems to me she's exercised more leadership in this than, than he has. Well, uh, yeah, Salud is extremely cautious, and he waits until the last minute before he commits. He's open to everybody. He, okay, let's talk about this, let's talk about that. She's taking out much more definite position. Um, and I think for the city of Santa Barbara, whose streets are going to be really choked up uh, once the freeway widening happens, um, it'll resonate. Yeah. Starshine, you had an exclusive interview this week right. with the author of Orange is the New Black, which is a popular cable TV. Is that, is that on HBO? It's a Netflix show. Net Netflix show. And, um, but also a book. In fact, it was a book before it was show. And um, not since Caged Heat has there been so much interest in a woman's prison memoir. What was your takeaway <laughs> from, from talking to her? You know what, she, so Piper Kerman served 13 months in Danbury Federal Prison in Connecticut um, on a drug charge. She, right, she, was, she went to Smith. She was a privileged sort of, um, you know, not quite Ivy League, but uh, Smithy and graduated and was like determined to be a bad girl for a little while and got into an affair with a, a woman there and um, that woman was working for an African drug lord so Piper <laughs> joined in and uh, participated in the fun and um, really went all around the world with this woman um, and then at a certain point realized it was probably not a good idea, got out of it, came you know kind of uh, moved to San Francisco, got her life in order, got a job in PR, and um, fell in love with this guy, and there, things were going great, and then all of a sudden she was indicted on charges for having participated in this drug crime five years earlier. And then five years later, finally, she was sentenced. So it was, wow. yeah, it was more than 10 years after the crime that she was sentenced um, and went to went to Danbury to do her time. And she wrote this memoir while she was in prison? She did right? not. She did not write. She wrote letters to friends while she was in prison. And then when she got out, her friends would ask her to tell them stories, you know, more stories, because who doesn't love a good women's prison story? And um, they said, you have to write about this. You have to write about this. So she did. She took the letters and uh, photocopied them and, you know, sort of patched them all together into this memoir that is a best-selling memoir, but also was turned into this Netflix series, which is based on her life, but there are some differences. There's a lot of differences. Some key differences, there? yes, yeah. there are. What would be the, the most key difference, would you say? So, um, Piper said that there, she didn't witness any violence in her 13 months there. Not not actual, like, real someone hurting someone violence. And if you watch the show, you know that there's there's girl fights and um, there's, all kinds of, there's all kinds of violence. Um, also, she said that, um, well, she didn't participate in any sex. There wasn't a lot of sex in the book. There, there's something that they call, um, there's, there's women in prison who are straight, there's women in prison who are gay, and then there's women in prison who she says are, quote, gay for the stay. Gay for the stay. Gay for the stay. Um, and she wasn't, she just, in, according to the book, you know, she was sort of faithful to her fiance. They were engaged at that point and um, didn't witness too much of that going on. But that's, on. that's, not, that's very unlike the book, though. Well, yeah, and so I mean, you know, the movie, TV, the, the TV right. show, TV yeah. needs TV needs gay sex. Yeah. So how does how does this become the uh, UCSB SB? Everybody reads this book. Yeah. So they chose it for um, for this month's uh, for this year's annual Who community chose reads. It? Who chooses? It? Um, it's a good question. UCSB and Santa Barbara Libraries, I believe, teamed up um, to have it to have everybody sort of read it. It brings up good questions about. Um, the correctional facilities and the way that we handle that sort of thing. And Piper herself has become a real advocate for prison reform since she, since she got out. She's on the women's 
prison board or something like that, and she goes around trying to, um, you know, convince people not to lock people up for low-level nonviolent crimes, which she says is a real waste of everyone's money and time. Which is, we just had a big vote in California right. about Proposition Prop 47, 47, which is now exploding in everybody's face because of yeah. a lot of uh, loopholes. Did she talk about that at all? She did. Interestingly, she said that um, I had brought up that Sandy Banks in the LA Times had written about it on Sunday. Sandy had been a big supporter of Prop 47 when the, when the election happened, and now she's coming back around, which I sort of respect in saying, like, I don't know, I might have made a mistake. I'm not ready to say so yet, but she's talking to police in LA who are saying that there's communities where um, you know, crime is actually on the rise in communities where they thought it was going to lower. And if people want to participate in the uh, Santa Barbara Reads program, what do they do? She's coming to speak at UCSB at 8 o'clock on April 15th. It's free. So we'll look for her on the 15th. Um, we're running a little short on time, but I want to ask uh, about one more issue, the drought. Uh, we're going to do a whole segment on it and the desal plant and all of these kind of meta issues. But I'm just wondering, how, how is it affecting you at home and you and you and you what are you are you doing anything about the drought at home other than complaining about your ridiculously skyrocketing water bill yeah we did we we let our lawn die dug it use it as an excuse to dig it up and plant drought tolerant plants took advantage of the city's uh funding thing you can get money back if you plant drought tolerant rebate plants. program it was really awesome um we keep a bucket in the shower for, to collect water Catch as it. it's warming up. Oh, nice. Oh, that's great. And then we use it to water plants or even, you, did you know you can flush the toilet just by pouring water down it? I learned that this year. It'll flush. <laughs> it will. Oh, you don't have to push a button. You just dump the water and it like What, goes what if away. it runs? Do you still you must jig? have a fancy you toilet. Jiggle animals? <laughs> no. What do you do? You don't have to do anything. Really? Yeah, it's my favorite way to flush now. That's probably the most <laughs> valuable thing that's been said in this entire half hour. <laughs> What are you What are you doing other than writing stories oh, about obscure <laughs> stories? No, you're you're that, really on this. You're, you don't miss Nick's columns on on, on the drought. There. Not That's taking like. as many showers, which uh, you know is great for my coworkers. It's a good thing I have an office to myself. <laughs> you know, the toilet isn't getting flushed as much, and uh, clothes aren't getting as washed as much. And. Well, you got decided, you got little babies at home and stuff. So that's well, one baby anyway. Yeah, I've decided to stop washing my car, but actually, I never, I never used to wash it anyway. <laughs> um, I don't know, you know. I, my wife's always yelling at me, you know, to turn the water off and to get out of the shower and all those things. And I try to be self-conscious and and do the right thing. Have you, do you take a shorter shower now? I do usually because the baby's screaming and I got to oh. get out, and my wife's telling me <laughs> that's not technically it's your that's, turn. That's it's your not turn. technically drought really. But uh, a lot of people have mentioned, you know, catching it you know, mm -hmm. as it warms up, and mm -hmm. sort of every time I hear that, I say, "I got to, we got to do that." So Just put a maybe. bucket in there; it's easy. Yeah, yeah, my next door neighbor, she puts us to shame. She comes out, you know, with these two big buckets and you know, waters her lawn, waters her her bushes. Um, we still haven't done that yet. We'll get around to that. Well, the sad thing is, I mean, people are really great in Santa Barbara and really throughout California. The conservation is, uh, you know, we're trying to meet a goal of 20% less use by Yeah, we're about 23% in the city. Montecito, about 50%. And the problem with Montecito being 50% is that they're selling less water, so the Montecito Water District <laughs> now has a $6 million shortfall. <laughs> and so, so they're coming up with a proposal that they're going to have a conservation surcharge on your bill. And so the more you conserve, the more higher you the rate you'll have to pay what? for having conserved. Yeah. Because now they may not have to do this because the water district has bought 2,500 acre feet from some Kern County agency. And so they're going to be able to be able to sell a lot more water this time. They, they were really up against it last year. Oh my God, we're going to die. This year they're going to have 2,500 more acre feet. So. But as you know, it doesn't really matter unless they save water in the Central Valley and destroy our agricultural. As you know, it doesn't really matter at all because we're going into the mega drought, which is yeah. like the Y2K and the Mayan calendar of uh, you know, <laughs> drought. <laughs> all right, I'm going to put you on the spot. Now, one really quick question. I'm going to go around. These are submitted uh, by uh, your fan clubs. And uh, I just want to ask. All right, the first one is, What's with Starshine? Was your father a hippie who starred in the in hair or something? 
<laughs> yes. The answer is yes. What's with Starshine the name? Yes, what's okay. with Starshine the name? <laughs> Just the human in general. Yes, yes. My dad uh, starred in Hair, played Burger in the first national touring company, and I was named after the song Good Morning Starshine. All right, this says for you, Josh. It says, Dear Mr. Molina, I often enjoyed your writing at the Mission and State website. Oh, Whatever happened to that anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Quick. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know what happened to it. A million it. dollars <laughs> down the drain. <laughs> I'm not privy to what happened behind the scenes, but I know while I was there, I did some good stories, mm -hmm. and fortunately that led to me being a news hawk and trying to continue the Mission and State mission there. But uh, I don't know. I, I was at Mission and State for a very short very, period of time. Very diplomatic, Josh. Relative to I think you Mission and diplomatic. State's overall existence. Very. So Ooh. I like to think that I All just right. came at the end. And last question for you is, the best thing about the independent print edition is the capital letters column. Why is it that, <laughs> why doesn't that talented young journalist appear more? Because he shows us up. <laughs> all right, well listen, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been great and uh, thank you all for watching. If you have suggestions or comments uh, or criticisms or anything, email us at sbcitydesk at gmail.com or check us out on Facebook at sbcitydesk.